in sun-spangled New Orleans, Super Bowl VI unfolded in a panorama of pageantry. This brilliant backdrop was spiced by a surprise arrival, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins were born in expansion, and during their first four years, they sought only respectability. Now, after two seasons under Don Shula, they were saluted as champions of the AFC. They had arrived at pro football's most important moment. And in the carnival atmosphere of Super Bowl VI, the Dolphins would celebrate the joy of an incredible season. While the Dolphins rode in the emotional crest, their opponents readied themselves with somber resolve. For even in the midst of sunny celebration, the Dallas Cowboys were haunted by a troublesome past. A past one man felt more keenly than anyone else. In Super Bowl VI, Dallas was determined to conquer its past as well as the Dolphins. The match was set. Two teams up from expansion. One bred in the NFL, the other with its roots in the AFL. Two teams which had never met. One out to earn the title of champion, the other trying to shed the label of loser. Super Bowl VI matched two coaching philosophies, Tom Landry's multiple offense, Don Shula's basic ball control. Over the years, the precision of the Cowboy offense has not altered. But in 1971, the synchro mesh of the Dallas attack added some salty dog, the Dodger, Roger Starbuck. The scramble is not Tom Landry's favorite play. But Starbuck had successfully used the tactic in nine straight victories since being named starting quarterback. Today, Starbuck's shoulder shaking would lead him down a dead end alley of dolphins. First quarter, Staubach left the pocket five times and lost a total of nine yards. While Dallas searched for its game legs, Miami came out ready to roll. At quarterback, Shula had reformed scrambler Bob Greasy, now disciplined to direct a basic ground game with Larry Zonka and 21 Jim Kick, a matched set of power backs. Early in the game, one play personified Shula's method. Kick cut down the backer. Guard Larry Little blew out the corner. Zonka shed a tackle, and Miami became the first team to cross the 50. Larry Zonka fumbled for the first time in 238 carries, and a moment of early Dolphin advantage passed to the Cowboys. The young Dolphin defense turned to its leader, Nick Bonaconte. Starbuck returned with a plan to strike at this Miami nerve center to gain control of Bonaconte's middle area. The implement of attack was a running game designed to start flow one way, then send the ball carrier cutting sharply back against the gray. Trapped out of position and blocked on every play, Bonaconte saw control of the middle slipping through his fingers. 
as Dallas running backs began to probe the heart of the Dolphin defense. The Dolphins finally held, and Dallas settled for a Mike Clark chip shot and a three to nothing first quarter lead. A Miami mistake had been converted into a Dallas score. One game plan had faltered. Another was beginning to assert itself. More film session on the NFL Network. The shadowy shapes of Cowboy Pass haunted Landry. A symbol of Dallas defeat had returned wearing aqua. To end the Paul Warfield curse, Landry dispatched number 34, Cornell Green, to follow every movement. To track him from sideline to sideline and cut off every inside route. With Green blanketing inside, cornerback Mel Renfro could drop outside. Smothered inside out, Warfield began to feel pressure where there was none. To stop the Dolphin ground game, Landry turned to another source. Bob Lilly had shared every nightmare of the cowboy past. Now he set out to rid himself of the memory. Lilly, the intimidator, breaking down Miami's plan of control and then pursuing it into all-out retreat. In the heat of the moment, ex-scrambler Bob Greasy had reverted to his old wild way. Greasy's 29-yard loss was a dramatic evidence of the trend of cowboy domination, but a less obvious pattern of control was being established along the front lines. Lissio, Nylon, Manders, Nye, and Wright. The cowboy offensive line, a machine well-oiled with experience, now held sway in the trenches. With clockwork precision, holes were pried open, and Walt Garrison popped through. rugged kinship of Garrison and the offensive line softened Miami resistance. Now Starbuck could rest easy in the pocket and strike up a passing attack. Still, something was missing, and for that something, Starbuck needed to look no further than his own huddle. Number 19, Lance Allworth, was ready. But he had spent a frustrating first quarter running roughshod through the Dolphin zone while Starbuck scrambled. He took his problem to the proper authority. And when the Dallas ground game stalled, the magical hands of Lance Allworth were ready. For a decade, the feats of this man had been legend, but now he was about to make what he would call later the two most important catches of his career.
on Allworth's first catch, he once again wove his way to the open area of the zone. On the second, his quick feet tapped out, touched down. A super receiver had finally found a fitting showcase for his skills. Allworth's touchdown gave Dallas a 10 to nothing lead with less than two minutes remaining. Warfield finally sifted through his escort to put the Dolphins within range at the Dallas 24. But Miami touchdown hopes fell harmlessly off Warfield's chest. A replay demonstrates why. Warfield broke free behind Green, but the Dallas safety reacted back to deflect the ball. Time was short, and Miami called on its tiny Cypriot hero, Garo Yapremian, to salvage three points. Miami had demonstrated its quick striking capabilities, and in a half dominated by Dallas, the Dolphins left the field still in contention 10 to 3. In session. The second half opened with tactical maneuvers on both sides. Shula and Bonaconte discussed means to seal the middle, while Landry planned counteraction. Miami sensed the importance of this first series. Hold or be swallowed up. Bonacati rooted in and tackled Manny Fernandez, stacked over center. The shock Dolphins watched Dallas fly outside. The flanks opened and Dwayne Thomas flowed into the secondary. When Miami scrambled to adjust, Landry sent in a fake pitch flanker reverse, and Bob Hayes flashed for 16 more yards. Then back to Thomas to weave his way home. <laughs> 71 yards in eight plays, seven of them sweeps, and the stunned Dolphins were suddenly down 17-3. The quick cowboy success was accepted without celebration. Still half a game remained, and Dallas had been guilty before of accepting victory too quickly. Veterans remembered other games seemingly won, only to be lost. This time they would not rest until they had thrown off the demon of defeat. Thomas, Garrison, Calvin Hill, and the offensive line plundered the Dolphins for a Super Bowl record 252 yards rushing. And Starbuck settled into his role of captain with easy confidence. But each time Starbuck reached back to put Miami away for good, Staggering Dolphins would hold on by a fingertip. Every time it was cornered, the scruffy no-name defense would hold its own, then lash back. The Cowboy offense controlled the game but could not put it away. Dolphin fate lay in the hands of a defense called Doomsday. Doomsday measured Miami for defeat.
with all its tools of victory depleted. The hour had grown late, very late for Miami. And now Doomsday would end the dream for good with another veteran of past failure, Chuck Howley, accepting the honor. In every season since 1966, Tom Landry had watched his team lose the one game that really mattered. Now he looked on as his Dallas Cowboys finally sealed sweet victory. Dallas led 24-3. And for the first time in their history, the crown fit. To more film session on the NFL Network. The hour had grown late, and the joyous trumpet blasts of Miami's arrival were now silent. The bright orange balloon of Miami's season had descended. The high crest of emotion now shrunken hard in the cold afternoon sun. But a memory remained. The image of a remarkable season put together by an unlikely team. The Dolphins were determined to have one last moment. Miami's last drive ended as had its first, and the domination was complete. In the gloom of the moment, the Dolphins could not be consoled. But a real triumph remained. They had come so far, so fast, and they would get another chance. Dallas had needed six. Just think, those people that had those white handkerchiefs waiting before we came out. I think they're going to use them to dry their eyes now. Look at them. Dry your eyes and weep. <laughs> we're number one. Hey, let's get better now. We'll improve out here in the next couple of series. Let's go. Yeah, we're in good shape now. But all we have to do now is just hold the ball. Yeah, that we got one solid quarter running tough, baby. Running tough. Ready? Set. Hutch you, hutch you, hutch you. You won't get back in there. Oh, no! Did we get enough? Looks like it. First down, dynamite. Get, get back in there. Go, Cal. Turn it up. Go, Cal. Run, baby. What a shot. Get up, Calvin. Get up, Calvin, and run harder, baby. Whoa, he's a little bull. Hey! Oh. Come on, official. Late hit. You know it was a late hit. Don't hit him, Calvin. Don't hit him. You're too big. Gotta be cool. You gotta be cool. What? Oh, 
okay. A fumble doesn't hurt us. We got the game. Hey, Rob. Wow, man, what happened? Hey, my tongue. Your tongue? I guess you realize now this is a pretty rough game. Or either that or you just keep the tongue in your mouth. All right. Ooh, man. Ooh, finally. Finally. Oh. What do you think, Coach? The Dallas Cowboys accepted their championship, not with a wild scream of triumph, but with an easy sigh of relief. Twelve years separated Tom Landry from his first dream to its realization, and in the end, the long, hard road made the final destination seem all the sweeter.